Thank you for inviting me. For me, uh, the concept of non-territorial autonomy is relatively new. And the whole exercise here, in some respects, is a thought experiment to see to what extent it is relevant to the case of Palestine and Israel. That's basically what I'm doing. And I'm going to try and historicize the quest in the sense that to test it against whatever mm -hmm. happened before. Uh, NTA, a context in Israel-Palestine, uh, is mainly, as Assad told us, relates to the discussion about alternatives to territorial partition. That's the context of NTA. There's a discussion about the fact that partition does not work because there's, uh, there's no way to separate the territory. This is the governing idea that uh, was entertained in Palestine Israel and the, in the 21st century, but also before the discussion, how can one go beyond partition? So that's where NTA enters. Now, chief organizing and explanatory concept in the post-1917, post balfour Declaration discussion of Palestine, and this is where NTA is supposed to be integrated, okay? Because there is a discussion that is going on, and then you think about alternatives. So what do we have there? A, we have a discussion about colonialism. Uh, in that sense, colonialism, in the discussion there, relates to the extent that the Zionist movement is a national movement or a colonial movement. That's the, the spectrum between the two. So that's an organizing concept that is there. Second, of course, there's nationalism. And when we speak about nationalism, we speak about Jewish nationalism or Zionism and Palestinian nationalism. This is the matrix where NTA is supposed to be introduced. Um, now, what I suggest to you here that the entire post-1917 history of the Palestine-Israel question can be explained by a recourse to the tension between individual and collective rights. I can explain the whole conflict <laughs> by these two terms, and, and, and that's what I'm, I will try to do. Now, what is the biggest problem for, for NTA in the Palestine-Israel context, in my reading, is that collective rights in the case of Israel-Palestine are understood always as national rights. Not ethnic rights, not religious rights, uh, not, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a lower so-called level of rights. I mean, that's the prevailing case in Israel-Palestine. Uh, so what I suggest is when one discuss NTA in the context of Palestine, the only alternative discussion is collective national rights in a sub-state configuration. Because both groups right, do not think about themselves as anything other than a collection of individuals that comprise national groups. OK? That's the, that's the case. It's not, uh, I don't think that they think about themselves in anything different. So um, in other words, and that's the last state, a collective non-national rights for example, collective linguistic rights or collective uh, regional rights, right? In Israel and Palestine, this is a profoundly secondary issue. The main contradiction here is between collection of individuals that think of themselves as nations. This is what we need to deal with. So NTA must, uh, th that's the case in, in Israel and Palestine. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm trying to historicize this issue very quickly, and it's going to be very quick. And if something is unclear, we can ask it. So I'm trying to historicize the issue of NTA in relation to empirical history rather than in relation to ideas of, for example, very smart German intellectuals that can sit in, at home in the 1920s and think about, for example, a model of binationalism. This is great exercise, but this is an exercise of people like us. I'm trying to see if NTA can be found in relation to specific policies that were attempted to be implemented on the ground by people that are more powerful than us. Okay? And here I'm going to touch a little bit about 1917, 1939, 1947, 1977. I'm going to mention, but I'm not going to discuss because I don't have time. And then hopefully say a few words about the 21st century. Let's go to a 1917 Balfour Declaration. The only correction that I will have to you, Amne, is that the Balfour Declaration does not contain the phrase the Jewish state. No? no? A Jewish national home. That's what it says. A Jewish national home. This is very important to bear in mind. 
Why? Uh, because the Balfour Declaration, what does it do? The Balfour Declaration in Palestine acknowledges individual and collective rights to Jews, and only individual, individual right to Palestinian Arabs that are the majority community at the time, indigenous community, right? The assumption of the British mandate and the Balfour Declaration that, that collective rights for Arab can be only realized outside Palestine. Hashemite Arabia, Hashemite Iraq, Hashemite Transjordan, Syria, all the power, some of the powers that collaborated with Britain and France in the First World War, gained independence immediately. Like uh, Arabia, it's not Saudi Arabia, it was Hashemite Arabia, because the Saudis did not control the state. So this is the imbalance of the Balfour Declaration. Right? Um, um, now, the Palestinians see Zionism as a form of colonialism, or as a form of surrogate colonialism. It is sponsored by British colonialism. They disagree, or they refuse the proposition that they should be offered only individual right in their country, because they say, hey, we are collective and we are a homeland minority, uh, majority, right? So what's the response? The response is anti-colonialism. That's, the, from a, that's what it is. Zionism is seen as a form of colonialism, and the struggle of the Palestinian people from this point onward is a struggle that is anti-colonial. That's what it is. And, right, now, because of the clash between the two communities, the British, after 15 years, said, OK, we have too much problem here. And in 1937, for the first time, they offered the concept of territorial partition to two states. I'm skipping it because partition is, is not something that we're going to discuss. So just bear in mind that 1937, for the first time, the notion of a Jewish state was adopted by an international power rather than by the Jewish people or the Zionist movement. The British offered the Peel Commission plan, create two national states, and maybe it will resolve the issue. It did not work, never mind. Two years later, this is the more, most interesting year 1939, once they understood, after a prolonged anti-colonial uprising by the Palestinian Arabs, the biggest one in the Middle East, that was very costly. A lot of people were killed by the British during these three years, 1936 to 1939. The British came up with another proposal, and this is the 1939 White Paper. Okay? And what is the ninth paper? The ninth paper said, okay, we are not going to discuss partition anymore because partition is not going to help. And that's the quote. His Majesty government believes that the framer of the 1922 mandate in which the 1917 Balfour Declaration was embodied, as you said, could not have intended that Palestine should be converted into a Jewish state. Reversal, right? Against the will of the Arab population of the country. So the British now withdraw the idea of partition. And they say the objective of His Majesty government is the establishment within 10 years of an independent Palestine state in the whole territory. The independent state should be one in which Arab and Jews share government in such a way to ensure that the essential interests of each community are safeguarded. The British White Paper of 1939 is the first profound document that entertained the possibility of a non-territorial autonomy. Why? Because it envisioned a single Arab state, and maybe I actually have it here, the white paper, what does it do? Disclaims any British intention to create a Jewish state, restrict Jewish migration to an additional 75,000 Jews every year, and the, the British 1931 paper said that the absolute maximum total of Jews in Palestine is going to be 600,000 people after four years, no more than above that. Okay? Above 600,000, you would need consent of the Palestinian Arabs. Okay? Uh, and this is the interesting thing, that the 1939 British White Paper proposes to establish in the territory one Arab state, right, that is going to include in it a Jewish national home, but not in the form of <laughs> state. Very interesting. This is something that is not going to discuss because the 1939 White Paper embarrasses both national movements. Because what's the response? David Ben-Gurion, of course, in the Zionist movement, rejected because Zionism is about is separatism, right? And they think about a Jewish separatist state. 
and they don't want to see themselves as a part of a non-state subnational group. So David Benjamin said this is 1939. We will fight Great Britain against Nazi Germany as if there was no white paper, and we will fight the white paper as if there was no war. That's the Zionist condition in 1939 after the rise of Nazi Germany. Interestingly enough, the mainstream Palestinian national movement too opposes the white paper too. And this is something that is important. Why? Because the White Paper of 1939 does not grant immediate independence to the Palestinian Arabs. That's what they want. We are the homeland, the indigenous minority. We want the uh, self-determination now, not in 10 years. OK, that's one. And B, from the Palestinian Arab perspective, the expectation is that the White Paper will block further Jewish migration into the territory now. Because the Palestinian Arabs already observed percentage-wise, and in absolute numbers, not absolute numbers, the greatest amount of Jewish refugees from Europe compared to any other place. That's from the Palestinian perspective. OK? Now, I'm moving now to 1947. And again, I'm going to discuss a chapter that is usually not discussed. Um, the partition resolution. Right, the two states, the Palestinians oppose. In my view, by the way, also the Zionists oppose, but that's a separate discussion. It's not true that the Zionists support your partition. Except that it's temporary. Yeah, never mind. But the more interesting interesting about 1947 is not the majority, <laughs> then, it's the minority. Then. The General Assembly of the United Nations sent a delegation of 11 states to investigate the question of Palestine. Seven members of the states thought about partition, right? They wrote the majority report. But there was a report, minority report, written by three states. Yugoslavia, yes. uh, India, and Iran. And India, Yugoslavia, and Iran proposed a minority plan, right? Um, and the minority plans was a proposal to establish in Palestine not a Jewish state, but a federation, yeah? a single federative state. The most important part of 1947 is that this plan was rejected. The fact that partition was rejected is a given, OK? Because, that's, that, that, because the Palestinian Arabs are not going to surrender a chunk of their homeland two European Jews that arrived 20 minutes ago. Doesn't make, uh, you know, despite the genocide in, in the country, of course, in, in Europe. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the, the, the both the Zionist movement and the Palestinian, mainstream Palestinian national movement opposed the minority plan. That's the issue of 1947, that they opposed federation. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, here is in a written words offered by Yugoslavia, Iran, and India for a single federated state to secure individual and collective rights. And this is very important because in 1947 there was a path not taken. And the path not taken was to establish a federation in the state, which is a state that's supposed to be neutral in relation to the two national groups. That was a consociational arrangement that was there. It was written and proposed and was rejected by Zionists, who did not want a federation, but a Jewish state, being separatists, and rejected by the majority population of the Palestinians, because they saw federation as partitioned by other means. This is why it was rejected. Um, very quickly, Assad, I'm going straight away to the 21st century. Right now, you have two streams. Partition does not work. You have two schools. One. A uh, school is the dominant one right now, the one state solution school. This is the dominant vocal dynamic active assertive of the two school. And this school <coughs> offers individual, equal individual rights for everybody. That's the dominant school for the one state solution. Nobody entertains collective rights. It's basically one person, one vote. And even the, the, the proposal in South Africa, the rainbow nation, uh, the, the South African post apartheid South Africa is a country that is defined by individuals. There's no binationalism there. Yeah? So, uh, so that's the dominant school. Seven million Israeli Jews to be granted rights as individuals. 
to be integrated in a future democratic state in a sub-national level. They are not seen as a national group. Israel Jews, not Jews in the world, huh? only Jews in Israel. Uh, that's the issue here. So what we have here based in an attempt to propose John Stuart Mill in Palestine. Okay. Uh, I'm going, I can give you a justification, yes, uh, of, uh, I'm skipping here, I'm only saying that, uh, mm -hmm. that the second school is the school that I think us at is uh, a profound member there, and that's the school that uh, emerged among mainly Palestinian Arabs in Israel, and this is a school that envisions binationalism, which is more interesting, uh, binationalism, a school that aims to grant both equal individual rights and collective rights to both groups. But this is the minority group among the one state solution right now, and you do not hear about them at all. That's my view. Thank you very much. Mm.